Welcome to this episode of Author Eke. I'm Travis Davis, your host. Tell us your story. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Author Eke. Today, I have Brad Hansen. And so how Brad and I met, we went to a uh, Fox and Friends uh, breakfast a couple days ago. And I had given Will Kane my book earlier. And later on, Brad came in there and gave him his book. And I said, man, I need to go talk to him. Uh, you know, it's, it's like a moth going to light. Uh, <laughs> so I had to go up and talk to him. And he gave me some great advice, got me some great connections. So I want to kind of introduce you to uh, Brad. But I want him to go in depth about himself. And then we're just going to start a free flow conversation about his book. What was the motivating factor? You know, where is he getting his inspiration, his drive? And just talk about his book in general and what he would do or advise for, you know, relatively new authors or some authors that are established that maybe just want a new perspective. Uh, so Brad, again, welcome to the show and uh, take it away. Travis, it's great to meet you. Brad Hansen and I have, I live here in the Salina area in North Texas and have been a published author since September 2nd of last year when my first book, The Secret Eye, was published. And I have, um, I come from a varied background. I did not actually start as an author. So this is my first endeavor. Uh, shall I say I came late in life to writing. I have written, but mostly it's been technical and working in the IT and telecom industry and have been a trainer for a lot of years. So I've done a lot of writing over the years, but have never really sat down to write a specific book. Awesome. The Secret Eye is actually the story of two men. One man uh, takes place, first of all, during World War II and in the Pacific Theater. And it is the story of a young man who feels the desire to join the military right after Pearl Harbor. He comes from a family of service, but there's been loss associated with that service. And there's great consternation within their family to decide, is this the right thing for someone to do, especially as young as he was? He was 17 when he joined. And he had to get- I can vouch school. for that. Me too. I was 17 years old when I joined the Army. So what do you got to yep. do? So he had to get special dispensation from his parent to be able to do that. He lost his mom when he was just a few years uh, before he, he joined. And that's what brings him into being part of this story. But there's also another man who joins his military about the same time and about the same age. And he lives at the foothills of Mount Fuji in Japan. His name is um, Hidaki Yamatsumi, and my uh, U.S. man is Charlie Brand. Now, Hidaki feels a desire or a need. Also, he's, he's actually struggling to try to figure out his way in the world. His father had gone to, uh, to work in or to fight in the Sino-Japan War, and he, he lost his life. So in the Japanese culture, Hidaki is responsible now at the ripe old age of 17 for his family. All of the possessions of that family, all the farmland, everything else that they have will transfer to him. And he has great desire once Pearl Harbor happens. There's a tremendous amount of... of um, nasty things that are being said about America and what they're going to do for or do to the Japanese. And he feels like he needs to um, to join the war, but he doesn't know how he's going to do this given his place in his family. So he struggles with that and he looks to his family, his ancient ancestors, 
and Mount Fuji for his inspiration. Excellent. Now, the thing that ties all of this together would be radar and its invention and use during World War II. That's how we get the secret eye. So as I am promoting this, I do a shorter version saying a young man joins at the age of 17 from the US, becomes the best radar operator in the fleet. And a young man from Japan joins his military and through a series of events becomes the kamikaze pilot that hits the USS Lexington in November of 1944. And that is the hook that usually gets people if I'm doing a, a book promotion. Mm. I can say that and people will go, huh. And there are a lot of military people who have come and discussed with this, this book with me and it's been a lot of fun. That's amazing. So, you know, folks don't realize, you know, radar was basically invented, uh, I think right prior to World War II. It was, and it was in, it was instrumental in the British being able to fight the Battle of Britain, because the British would know beforehand where the aircraft were or were coming from, so they could go ahead and launch their Spitfires and Hurricanes. The chain and, home network. Yes, exactly. And what's interesting when I so I was in the army, and one of my responsibilities I used to uh, patrol the East Western border. And eventually I became the operations sergeant of a uh, concern in Coburg, Germany. That was where all of the, uh, the, the soldiers that patrolled the border for that sector, that's where they stayed. That's where they were housed. And we always had a, what we call a ground surveillance radar team with us. And you, so you think of radar, okay, planes, right? It's all about planes. Radar is, was used very judiciously during the Cold War, mm -hmm. because they could actually determine footsteps, track vehicle, wheel vehicle, where it was coming from. And that really helped then, you know, build, build a picture. That's what radar does. It builds a picture that nobody is knowing they're getting their photograph taken. Yeah. Right. You think of it like that. That's where you get the silent eye. Nobody knows it. You don't feel it. But as an operator, you, okay. And you, you become better at it. No, you know, Pearl Harbor, they were, those planes were picked up in radar, but that, but it was so new, I think, that people were like, oh, they, you know, this is our B-17s coming in from the United States, when it was actually. Yes, the exactly. Plane. Yeah. And, and so my book is a historical fiction novel. Mm -hmm. So I took real people and the real events that were happening. And I, tr I start the book by looking at um, the start of um james watt or robert watt i should say mm -hmm. who was responsible for the development of radar in england and the very first test so we open up the book with them traveling down getting ready to set up for their first test and i talk about setting up the entire environment and how all of this happened and then how the cavity magnetron makes its way. And the cavity magnetron is the actual um, piece of equipment that was invented by the English, by the Brits. And that was what allowed us to go from one or two mile range to over a hundred. And so in front that of making its way <laughs> to the United States. And so I follow along and I interject my two people into the stories of how radar was used, primarily looking at the US version of radar, not as much the Japanese radar, because it was not as well used. Um, but I spent a lot of time talking about how we got into Pearl Harbor, mm -hmm. where I introduced, of course, Roosevelt and all of the major players, including Namuri, who was the, um, the Secretary of State for Japan, if you will, mm -hmm. at that point. So it was very interesting to write these in these the dialogue between these people. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine myself as Roosevelt. And I've heard Roosevelt speak a number of times, but it was trying to get his cadence and to think about how he would say something. And then um 
I think about how um, the hunt for Red October was written mm -hmm. and the interactions between the Russian ambassador and the U.S. ambassador. And I thought of myself as these were coming in and the cat and mouse game that they were playing. Yeah. And so all of these things sort of come into your mind as you start to write about these events. And I would, I started at the beginning of the war and I went through major battles. And then I tried to find ways to connect my characters mm -hmm. into those spots. And I chose to use usually one chapter for the US and then I went over to the Japanese perspective. So mm -hmm. people would ask me, is this just a book of, that bashes the Japanese? No, it doesn't. It talks about their motivations. I had to take some liberties, as you will in a fiction, but I did use a lot of the people and a lot of, of research on how they decided to um, set up their battle plans for the Battle of Midway, as an example. And so it was very, very interesting. And even just Pearl Harbor, the deception that they did mm -hmm. by traveling up and attacking us in Dutch Harbor. Most people don't even know if you're a, a deadliest catch fan, you know Dutch Harbor, that's where everybody goes out for crab fishing. Well, that was attacked by the Japanese and taken over. That was the only yeah. time in US history that a portion of the US had been taken over by a foreign country. Exactly, and nobody knew you know, they, it was, um, as people would say, squirrel. It was their squirrel moment. But the Japanese were so complicated in how they put things together that that is what their downfall was. If they were more simplified in their approach, uh -huh. there were many things, you know, the war could have ended differently. So what, I mean, a fabulous story. So what motivated you to write this and where do you kind of get your inspiration? Now, my mother married um, a man that in her second marriage that I had known all my life. He lived kitty corner to me across, you know, across the yard from us. And uh, his name was Charlie Stainer. And Charlie Stainer served during World War II. He was a radar operator. He served on the USS Lexington. Oh, amazing. And okay. he served also on the USS Yorktown. So he was about 20 feet away when the kamikaze pilot hit in November of 1944. So we heard many stories about his life growing up in Arkansas. And go Razorbacks. Of, what's that? <laughs> go Razorbacks. <laughs> exactly. So lots of lots of really interesting stories, but he really didn't talk as much to me, his stepson, as much as perhaps he did to his older children about his time in the military. So when he died in um, 2012, I wanted to do something to honor him. And I you know, thought, well, I could write a story. I could write a book about him. Mm -hmm. But he was just a guy. You know, he, nobody knew his name. He's not in a history book anywhere. In fact, when I would do my research and I would go into Ancestry and go into Fold 3, which is the Ancestry version where you can see all of the military battles, uh, you can research a particular unit or a ship, and you can see the muster rolls, all of those things. Um, I had a hard time actually tracking him and being able to find his rank and, and so on. But I knew enough about what he was doing uh, that um, as a man of God, I uh, enjoy driving around and uh, driving around in the country. Mm -hmm. And this thought occurred to me as I was struggling with how do I, how do I write a story? And it came to me, the kamikaze who hits a ship being protected by a radar operator. Oh, and amazing. so that thought was what drove everything mm -hmm. from that standpoint. Amazing, amazing. So you did a lot of research, evidently. So I spent three years researching the book. Oh, wow. I uh, spent a lot of time 
in fact, there were many unclassified documents that I was able to find on the internet. And there were a lot of great stories. Um, much of the battle sequences mm. are actually accounts from other people. Right. And I, I have, um, I've traveled a lot in my career and I've been to the Chicago O'Hare Airport. And if you've never been to Chicago O'Hare in the A terminal, hidden away at the very, very front of the A terminal is uh, Butch O'Hare's plane. And so I was very interested in looking at how O'Hare, who actually served on the Lexington, amazing how all of these things come yeah. together in my life. How many times I've been there, have seen that plane, and now I'm writing a story where he is front and center, along with my stepfather, fictionalized, obviously. Uh -huh. But it was it was very, very interesting to do all of the research. I love history and military history. World War II has always been my uh, greatest interest, even as a young boy. Yeah, my dad you. was, he read every book, I think, on World War II. Uh, more more on the Pacific side than the German side, mm -hmm. he, and and he could just know. And he's a he just a high school dropout, spent twenty years in the Air Force, country boy that just read ferociously, and had just the knowledge was just amazing. But yeah, I too, I, I I'm pretty I like the World War II history, but I found you know as I do more research in World War One, that's fascinating because. Without World War One, there would never have been a World War Two, correct? Uh, because of you know the events in uh, I believe Yugoslavia, uh, the Serbian uh, you know assassinating the uh, king of Ottoman Empire, Austrian mm -hmm. Ottoman Empire, I believe. Uh, so it, it's fascinating when you start looking at all these world events, and then okay, then you start looking at the Middle East. Well, that became out of the World War One too because the British divided. And the rest of these powers divided how they were going to divide the Middle East and Africa and everything else. Mm -hmm. And all these things are intertwined. And what you're able to do is take a particular individual and link him with other individuals for significant event or a time period in U.S. history to make it where you would never think about the role that that individual played in his survival and the survival of others on the ship, and not only his ship, other ships exactly right and you're talking uh what less than 10 years after the invention of uh radar probably oh it yeah. was it was less it yeah, was yeah five years three, probably. three years yeah so yes so and one of the stories like you know and i follow the loss of the lexington the first lexington and york times and what's interesting is that my stepfather charlie came into the war just as the second uh, Lexington was being commissioned. Mm -hmm. And so he was in 43-ish, uh, in 44, and he did his training in San Diego. Now, you can't find a lot of information about that San Diego facility, mm -hmm. um, but I did find an interesting, um, you had flight directors, who were instantiated inside of these battle groups. And they were the ones, when you see these pictures, um, it's very interesting. There's an actual picture of, that you can see on the USS Lexington in Corpus Christi, where you have men that are sitting there. There's a guy that's got his headset on mm -hmm. and he's up on a stool and he's kind of directing everybody. And you have an underlit um, board and then you have a guy who's standing there writing backwards on a marker board. On a My clear brother board. did that. My brother did that. And he was an air defense command in the Air Force. He did that. He could write backwards. I'm like, exactly. And that's what Charlie backwards. had. Exactly. Yeah. So these guys would have to go to training. Mm -hmm. And I write in my book about how Charlie was doing his training. And they were, they set up a mock environment inside of a large hangar. They put strings at angles and they had a bunch of bicycles that they were able to, based on the number of rotations, they were able to bring planes down 
And then they were able to use um, radar. This is how I had it. Use radar to find out where they were coming from. And so there was usually, I had a competition with another one of his uh, radar friends. And they were com competing to be the best in that particular class. And that's where Charlie is noticed and how he gets to go to MIT for the latest and greatest of radar technology and be assigned into the USS Lexington. So you're, what you're saying is in 1940 was the first iteration of Peloton with yes. actual, uh, <laughs> instead of a screen, you actually had things in front of you. It's like, it's more realistic than, uh, you know, looking at a monitor. Exactly. So they actually had things. So yeah, so that's what the invention of the Peloton was actually in 1940 something. So that's exactly. good. <laughs> that's good enough. So what's on the horizon? Where where can people find you? Where is your book? And if you got, I see your book up there over your right shoulder, right? Uh, because mm -hmm. you're kind of uh, mirrored. Uh, so if you know, if you got one to show it and tell us what your, what your next thing is, where they where people can find you, where they can find your book, and and if, after that, if you can give some advice to some maybe folks that are writing their first novel or written it or contemplating, you know, publish, self-publish, hybrid, uh, marketing, you know, your perspective, because, you know, talking to you, you've been uh, fairly successful. Sure. So I, I'll, I'll start with the last question first. Okay, perfect. So as I was deciding how to publish as a first time publisher or first time author, let's be honest, you're not going to find a publisher who is going to publish you. And so that means that the self-publishing industry is where you need to go. So you need to do your research. You need to determine for yourself, because everyone will tell you theirs is the best, and they really enjoy their experience. Both Travis and I have different experiences. I used a company called Book Baby. They're out of New Jersey. They're an excellent um, source of information. They have hours worth of blogs that you can read that help you to understand the entire process of publishing a book from the subject matter that you need to write and to be absolutely perfect on to all of the front matter and how to copyright your book and how to market your book. They have marketing resources. They'll hook you up with Smith Publishing if you want to. And Smith Publishing will give you various packages of being able to market your book that way. You can also um, have various publishing packages. I chose to use a publishing package that gave me worldwide distribution. I have an ebook and I have a what they call a trade publication. So the trade publication is a paperback, like what you would expect to see, but they Here's call the it cover. trade format. Right. And the first thing is how how many pages should you be writing for a historical fiction or even a fiction novel? And so you know my book ends up being. Um, just shy 300 pages, which seems to be the right number that most people would say. You can't have it more than 150, but you know, based on the type of book that you're writing, you need that. Yeah. You need to have an idea of what you want for a cover. Now, based on who you go to, you may have somebody who is a graphic artist who could do something like this for you. I had a vision in my mind. I gave a vision to their graphic artist. They took care of it. You may think that you're the best editor that ever lived. Not you, me. But you're not. <laughs> not me. You are not. You're never going to be the best editor. In fact, I found the best editor, and she's over in the other rooms watching television right now. Um, I should have used her first before I spent the money editing because we would have found less. And so you must edit professionally. You cannot have yourself, or for that matter, even your wife, who may be an excellent editor, edit for you. And when it comes to the formatting of your book, it's absolutely critical 
that you use professionals who know the right way to format a book. Mm -hmm. We may, in our business environment, formatted a ton of things and made it look pretty good. And people say, you got a great eye. Well, for publishing, it's an entirely different animal. And templates are what people use now to put their book in there and to fill everything out. This goes directly from a PDF to a self-publishing company. The self-publishing company will make a proof of it after they've done their editing and then they will send it to you. You better make sure that you look at that proof seven, 10, 20 times mm -hmm. before you send it out. Because once this thing goes to bed, it costs you money. I'm the guy who did it to redo it. And yeah. I've had to twice go back through because there were glaring errors that I missed. So you got to make sure that you do that. Partnering with somebody. And I want to reiterate that right there which you just said yes go back through and if you find errors don't be afraid to go back and fix them and put it out again right but if you have the story just get it right and i would agree take your time walk away come back read it have somebody else read it but take your time because uh, that's critical so i, I you got 100 uh, percent agreement and I'll probably every other author in the world can agree with right. you on that. Yeah, so there are lots of self-publishing groups around. Um, I know Travis uses Deviant, and there, there are lots of them. And what you do is you go and you look at the things that if you happen to have a professional editor, friend, somebody who works in publishing, then you may be able to hire your friend for less money. But it's not an inexpensive no. task to get something edited. Then they charge either by the page, usually by the page. And the thing is, they don't want it all crammed together. They want it double spaced so they can read it, they can. But the great thing is that when you have an editor that's really good, they make your book better. Yes, I was... I knew I had some part of it that was sort of a little kludgy and they came in with a better way. Oh, and then they fixed things. There was interactions with the love story. They made some suggestions. You can have copy edit, you can have story edit, and you can have a full blown edit where they look at the development of the characters and all of those things. Mm -hmm. Those are the usual matters. I tried to go with a company uh, and have them do an edit. And I found that they were they were really fly by night. And I was able to get my money back, thankfully. Okay. And that's when oh, I good. just decided I'm going to go with a company that has a well-known reputation in the industry. They were the, one of the first to do self-publishing. People that truly understand. And I've seen their facility, not live like you right. did, Travis. Right. But I have seen their facility and I've seen the type of printing that they do. A very good friend of mine works, has worked in the printing industry. And when I told him what they were doing, oh, he says, oh, yeah, that, that's great stuff. We used to sell that to newspapers and, you know, super, super high quality. And uh, so yeah. I did a lot of research on who I should use. Yeah, as I'm, much a, I'm as a big fan of, of uh, I'm a big fan of Book Baby. So I've, I've looked at those guys quite extensively. So I'm a big fan of those folks. Uh, they, and I've talked to them. They seem very, very professional. And yes. It's not like, okay, you got to do this now or, you know, you, the deal's gone or whatever. Like, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to buy a car. You know, I am actually doing it. So from a marketing perspective, what have you found, uh, you know, the top three marketing things that you would recommend? Well, as a historical fiction writer, I found historical fiction groups. And once you start and you have your Twitter and you have your Instagram and you have LinkedIn and everything else yeah. that you have for your social media, people will find you and they will say, you know what? I will, for $50, I'll go ahead and write X number of reviews. Mm -hmm. The unfortunate part is that you're gonna have to pay them to review 
because you don't have enough friends yes. who will read your book and go to Amazon and write a, re a review for you. So well, have you, uh, is your book in the Museum of the Pacific down? In, I have uh, been trying to get it in the Museum of the Pacific down in Fredericksburg. Um, Fredericksburg and I've yet to, I'm going to have to physically go there, but it, I've actually, um, it's on the USS Lexington Museum. Oh, nice. And I've been trying to get to the Yorktown Museum as well. Plus, I, I want to go over and market to the World War II Museum in New Orleans. Those are all places that I'd like to spend time. Um, but again, the most important part is that you're going to have to get reviews on your books. That's the number one thing mm -hmm. that you'll be told by anybody else. You need to get pre-reads and you need to get those reviews ready to go because the only way anyone's going to buy your book is if they see that you have 100, 200, 1,000 five-star reviews. And, and you need so, to make sure that your parents don't just write a review that's a five-star. <laughs> they need to do a real yeah. review. It, it yeah. has to be honest. And also, um, putting yourself out there for publication or um, for uh, various contests, that's yeah. how you get your name known. And of course, they're going to tell you X number of these will be seen by publishers and they might pick up your book. Your book might become a movie, you know, and I'm thinking, well, how can you make this movie? It's going to be expensive. So, you know, I wasn't, <laughs> uh, I would buy into that thought, but, you know, those are all things that you do. Um, and there are, are, are prog programs like Sendable where you can have your own social media presence without actually having to spend the money on somebody. You can write your posts and you can put a whole month's worth of posts out mm -hmm. there and then it will post daily, minutely, however much you need to. And that's just the thing that I didn't do as well as I should have. If so, I had spent more time spending doing that and tying it to events in World War II or events in history, yeah. uh, that would have gotten more people. But so, I have close to 10,000 books sold. Um, so I, I feel good. good about my first effort, but it's also a very niche environment. Yeah, so basically what he has just said, everybody, is if you think that once you write it, you're done, that's totally false. You, While you're writing and while it's in that stage, from once you put it in production to you get the book, you have got to be actively uh, and proactively marketing that book. So when it does come out, it's ready to go. And you have to continually market that book all the time. Uh, that's something that I didn't realize, right, that I'm getting better at uh, doing a lot of research. But, it, you know, unless you've got, you know, War and Peace or the next Red October, Hump to Red October or the next Harry Potter series, you have got to get out there and market those books. And it's it's not a overly expensive, but you've got to be able to do that. Uh, and that's something that I will do on my uh, the next book that I put out here in the next uh, few months. We'll be marketing it heavily, and then at the same time marketing the first book. So I think that's uh, very key. So where can people find you? So my website is uh, https um, bradhanson dot uh, net. And there you can find um, the link to my book, both on Book Baby and also on Amazon. And uh, I also have some other, you know, swag that people can buy if they'd like to. Mm -hmm. But you'll see links to all my social media. Um, Twitter is uh, Brad Hansen Writes, or that's, um, I'm sorry, Facebook. Um, Brad Hansen Author, both in Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn. I have my professional LinkedIn profile attached to that because I'm not yet a full-time writer. So not many people are. Yes, <laughs> that's more, true. The more so, authors I talk to, the less that are full-time. Everybody, I mean, I'm kind of between things. So I, I do, I do. Uh, but a lot of them are, they have, and, and folks realize that, that this, this is, people write because it's a passion. Most because it's it, it's a lonely sport. 
<laughs> it is. Least. Yeah, in fact, I was just at a meeting this morning where we were talking about um, how men in general um, have a fear of rejection. And as an author, that is the number one reason that you will stop writing and you will not finish whatever you started is because you're afraid that people are going to reject what you wrote. And I would say to you that you need to ensure that you're writing for yourself but making sure that the audience that you are trying to go for understand so you have to put yourself in your audience in mm -hmm. fact such a a man book like a world war ii novel i wrote and the people that pre-read it were all women mm -hmm. because i wanted to see if it would resonate with them so you need to find your audience but the only person that you're really writing for is you mm -hmm. and if you feel that you have a quality product then you need to put it out there and it's just like anything else. Everybody has an opinion. Some people are going to like what you wrote. Some people are not. And there are some people that will be willing to give you feedback and say, you know, I like the way that you do your dialogue. Mm -hmm. I like the way that you construct a story, but I'm missing detail or I'm missing the, um, the overarching themes that are driving a book. You know, all of these kind of things are what people need to hear. And if you're not receptive to those, mm -hmm. then you will be the writer, the first writer uh, of a book. What I'm saying is that you will only be able to write that type of book. You won't be able to grow and expand. Mm -hmm. Great. So, not yeah, many yeah. people can be a first time writer like John Grisham or Tom Clancy and have immediate success. Right. Yeah, it takes time. It's uh, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, so that's definitely about it. So, well, Brad, thanks for uh, joining today. And it was a pleasure talking to you. It was a pleasure meeting you the other day. Yes. You know, uh, happenstance. Um, so it was great talking to you and had a good time. And folks, go out and pick up this book. It's very interesting. Uh, and I think you get not only from a fiction perspective, but it may enlighten you in what you know, some technology that uh, is pretty interesting, it's pretty cool. There's, you know, if you see it in action, it's really neat. And I, I, I have the pleasure to be able to do that for my time in the Army. Uh, so great. Well, thank you very much. Have a great day. And uh, it's been a pleasure meeting and talking to you. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hey, thank you for listening. Join us next week for another episode of Author Eke. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye.